course, we know that today is nationally recognized as Father's Day. But just as was true with Mother's Day, <clears throat> we have no uh, sanction in Scripture to celebrate it religiously. And yet, at the same time, it is a good opportunity for us to honor our fathers, to strive to please them as they follow the Lord, and even if it is the case that our fathers are no longer with us, we can still follow them as they follow Christ. But we also need to recognize that this is something that we should do, not just one day out of the year, but on a regular basis. And so then, for the next few moments, we're going to be considering in the Scriptures a number of fathers who please the Lord. Now, one of the things that we'll notice in our study together is that these men had certain characteristics that were going to enable them to be well-pleasing to God. But what we're going to be looking at specifically are a number of things that's tied directly to the fact that they were the kind of fathers that God expected them to be and required them to be. And so then, they are fathers who please the Lord. Let's look at a number of examples. First of all, of course, there is Enoch. Now we read about Enoch in the fifth chapter of the book of Genesis, verses 21 through 24. And then in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. <clears throat> Interestingly, there's not a great deal that is revealed to us about this man of God, but enough is revealed that it enables us to know some great things about him. Let's look at the Old Testament scripture, verses 21 through 24 of Genesis 5. Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty-five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now you'll note here, first of all, that it is said more than once that Enoch walked with God. That's very <coughs> significant because when you think about an individual who walked with God, and by the way, Enoch is not the only Old Testament scripture of whom it is said that he walked with God, but that denotes companionship. And when you think of an individual who has a close companion, the fact that he walks with this individual, and the idea is not that he walks on a one-time basis, but it is a continual walk. And so anything and enjoyed a continual companionship with God, in that he loved the Lord, he trusted in God, he had the kind of faith that was well pleasing to God, he was, to sum it up, just simply a man of God. And when I say simply, that doesn't mean to de emphasize that, but by way of summarizing, he was a man of God. Now, obviously, if an individual has these characteristics, you know that it is going to have a great effect, a profound effect on his children. And of course, as you can see here from the text, Enoch was a father. He had sons and daughters. So the fact that he walked with God then is going to have a great and a lasting effect upon his children. All right. You look at the New Testament passage that mentions Enoch. Hebrews 11 and verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Oh my, oh my. You look at that, that verse of Scripture, and there's a lot that almost just jumps out at you. And it was translated. No other individual 
of whom it was said that he was translated. The idea there is that he was changed, his physical body was changed into that, that glorified spiritual body, and he bypassed the appointment of death, thanks be to God. So that in and of itself then tells us that he had a very special relationship with the one with whom he walked. A special relationship. But then you look at the very last part of the verse. You look at the last three words, he pleased God. I'm going to tell you something. If that was the only thing of which it was said about Enoch, that would be enough. That would be enough to tell us a number of things about him just in those three words. He pleased God. He was the kind of man that pleased God. He had the kind of faith that pleased God. He is mentioned, as you can see, in Hebrews 11, in that great hall of faith. So he was a great man of faith, trusting, obedient to God in every aspect of his life. It's no wonder that he was the kind of father that pleased God. So this tells us then that Enoch provided for his sons and daughters the example that they needed to follow. And interestingly here, you'll notice that in both accounts, the Old and the New Testament, you don't read anything about specifically about his relationship between himself and his children. But you don't have to read it verbatim because you can find it in these verses. He provided the example for his children. And so then, as his children looked at their father, as they observed their father, they were seeing one that they could emulate. They were seeing one who, whom they could follow, they could strive to imitate in their lives. They were seeing one who wasn't just telling them what they needed to know in order to please God, they could observe it by the life that he lived. What a great example that he must have shown to his children. A father who walked with God. But then we look at Noah. And again with Noah, you read about him in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, and he's mentioned in that great hall of faith of the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 11. Noah was another man who was certainly well-pleasing to God. Let's look at these accounts. Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in the generations. And Noah, look at this, here you have it again. Noah walked with God. God was Noah's constant companion. Noah trusted in God. Even when the instructions that were given to Noah seemed to go against every ounce of common sense uh, that an individual might possess. Even when the instructions themselves just simply don't make sense because in Genesis chapter 6, by the time you get down to that point, it had not rained on the earth. You go back to chapter 2, and you'll find the way that God watered his earth. He watered the earth from a mist that rose up from the ground. And so here, at this point then, God tells Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth along with every living thing. But Noah <coughs> is the one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a good man. He was a righteous man. He was a just man. And so when God tells him what he wants him to do, Noah obeys him implicitly. <coughs> he is obedient to God. Look at the New Testament account in Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, Moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness 
which is by faith. And so, again, even with this, where Noah is concerned, you read just the first few words, and it tells us a great deal about him. By faith, Noah obeyed the Lord. He did that by faith. Now, when you look at Noah and the work that, uh, that God assigned him to do in saving <coughs> the human family, Noah taught his children. Let me tell you something. We read in the scriptures where Noah preached for about 120 years. And he was a preacher of righteousness, as Peter says later. A preacher of righteousness for over a hundred for about 120 years. Let me tell you something. When Noah, all that time, was preaching to those who were unrighteous, those who were ungodly. There were three boys who were listening to that preaching as well. And they heard that preaching on a daily basis. But where they were concerned, it was not a situation of do as I say, not as I do. Because they heard their father preaching to the lost world. But they were able also to observe the life that he lived. And Noah, being the man of faith that he was, that was something that was unmistakable. That was something that was observable just by observing his life. His boys were able to see, my father is a man of faith. So what did he do where his sons were concerned? He taught them. That's implied in the text. He taught them. Someone may say, well, you know, Noah preached for about 120 years, and he didn't save anyone with all that preaching, you know, all those years. Well, he saved his family. That's more than a lot of people could say. He saved his children. He saved his sons. Not only by his preaching, but by the life that he lived before. And so he taught them. It's so important then that we understand as fathers the need to be <coughs> teachers. We are to be the instructors for our children. Now, certainly, we don't do this to the exclusion of our wives, to the exclusion of our children's mothers. But we work, we cooperate with her to provide the teaching that they need. But it is so important though that we make sure that we instruct them and provide the example for them. We'll talk more about the example in a moment. Look at Abraham. Again, with Abraham, we read about him in Genesis 18. Uh, a great deal is said about Abraham, about his life. And again, he was one of those fathers who pleased the Lord. Look, if you will, in Genesis 18, and verse 19. And as we noted, a late week or so ago, you have three angels approaching Abraham as he sits in the door of the tent in the heat of the day. One of those angels is identified as the angel of the Lord. And Abraham entertains them. He, he provides a meal for them. They sit with him for a while. Then after a while, they arise and they're about to, they're about to walk away from his tent. Of course, one of the uh, things of hospitality that they did back there in those days is that uh, Abraham would walk with them for a piece. Then as he's walking with them, Abraham's able to hear what the angel of the Lord says. That, of course, is the second person in the Godhead. And the first thing then at that point that the angel of the Lord says is, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I will do? seeing that he will make a great nation. And, of course, in the text, that thing which he plans to do is to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the Jordan Plain. He's walking along the angel of the Lord, along with the other two angels. They turn their faces toward the, toward the city of Sodom. They're about, the two angels are about to be sent there. And the Lord himself is speaking. He's not speaking to Abraham. But he says in verse 19, I know him. It appears from the text that the angel of the Lord 
may very well speak, be speaking to the other, to the two angels that are with him. And so he says, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. I know him. Oh, what a compliment. People compliment us in our lives. And sometimes they compliment us because of something we've done. Maybe they compliment us because of our character, maybe because of our family, our children, our grandchildren. And we appreciate those compliments, and they always mean a great deal to us. But think about this. This was a compliment that was paid to Abraham by the Lord. And the Lord says concerning Abraham, I know him. I know where his family is concerned. I know what he's going to do. I know the kind of leader that he's going to be, that he is for his family. And I know that where his family is concerned that he's going to be the leader that they need, that he will teach them to keep the way of the Lord and to do justice and judgment. I know him. What a great, great compliment that was. And the Lord can feel the same way about us. But it's up to us. We read, in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And so even, even here in this passage of Scripture, it's more than just instruction. You bring them up. You don't just teach them how they need to live, but you show them how to do it. And so they're able to, just like the children of these other men that we look, that we look at thus far, our children should be able to observe our lives. They should know how we feel about the Lord. They should know how we feel about the church. They should know how important God, the King, the prayer, the Word of God is to us. And so we instruct them and we train them. We nurture them so that they can become the men and women that the Lord would have them to be. That has to do with being a model. And that's what Abraham was, where his children were concerned. You could use the word example, as we looked at earlier, but he was the model. And a model is something that, that is patterned in such a way that you can say, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. And his children, Abraham's children, could observe his life and they could have the they could have the thoughts and they likely did. I want to be like my father. And well, this was this was Genesis 18. Now you keep reading two great chapters later. There you have the greatest test of a man's faith that's ever been given. When God tells Abraham, I won't get off right. When you offer him as a sacrifice. Now, Isaac was still young, likely at this particular point in time, maybe 17, 18 <coughs> years of age, uh, maybe 19, but, but he's very, very young. No doubt he'd been taught by his father. No doubt Isaac was able to see the faith that his father had. And not only did Isaac pass this test, but his own son was able to witness the kind of faith that his father had. And by observing his father, Isaac was able to see where my father is concerned, God must be obeyed in all things. Oh, what a model he proved to be for his children. And in the New Testament, in Romans 4, verse 11, Paul refers to him as the father of all them that believe. That's tied directly to his faith. And then there's Joshua. Joshua, the successor of Moses. 
And in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, verses 14 and 15, we read where Joshua presents a challenge to the people of Israel. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods that your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood. The flood there is not a reference to the Genesis flood, but rather to the, to the, uh, uh, to the Jordan River, which was oftentimes in a flooded stage. So that's what he refers to there. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods that your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And so in presenting this challenge to the entire nation of Israel, thousands of people, Joshua tells them you've got to make a choice. But then he tells them, here's the choice I've made. As for me and my house, me and my family, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Not everyone in Israel had the kind of faith that Joshua had. And so in a very real sense, it required a great degree of courage to say that before the entire nation. But Joshua was a courageous leader. He was a courageous soldier. And in fact, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, one of the things that God told him was only be thou strong and very courageous. Be thou strong and very courageous. Because you see, if he was, he would be successful. And he was. He was strong. He was courageous. And so it's no wonder then that he was the great man of God that he was. His children would be able to look at him and see the courage that he had as the leader of their family. And no matter what others did, no matter whether or not others departed from the way of the Lord, and sometimes to even go after false gods, pagan deities, they could see that their father had made the decision we're going to serve the Lord. That's what this family is going to do. We're going to serve God. He was determined to lead his family, to lead his children in the path that they should go. These are some of the fathers that please the Lord. We can look at others whom we read in the Old Testament and in the New. And the question is, where fatherhood is concerned, are we the kind of fathers that please the Lord? Are there certain characteristics in our own lives that make us the fathers that God would have to be? And that does, certainly does not mean that there is perfection in any area, because there's always room for improvement with every one of us. But then there's the need for us to examine our lives on a daily basis. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 13 to 5, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Well, where fatherhood is concerned, examine yourselves to see if you're the father as God would have you to be. And if you're not, then make the necessary corrections. Make the necessary changes. Because the greatest thing that you can do is to be the kind of father by which you can take your children and have them with you. But you can only do that if you're the example, the model. You do the work that is required in being the father of our children. If you're here this morning and you're not a New Testament Christian, we encourage you to obey the gospel. Our Lord said in Mark 16 and 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. We encourage you to put Christ on in baptism and in so doing become a Christian, become a member of the Lord's church. If you're an unfaithful child of God, come back home to the Lord through repentance and prayer. 
If there are changes that you need to make in your life, it doesn't necessarily require public confession. Friends, let's make those changes. Be the Father as a God that has to